years the storm is coming fast the day will soon be here when those who are caught unprepared will be the first to fall that much is clear hello and welcome to physical attraction the tale to wow key specials but we'll be examining the end of the world one apocalypse at a time and survive while there's people crying, people dying everywhere around. Hello and welcome to this Teot Wauki special of Physical Attraction, where you're listening to the second part of our climate change episode. In the last show, I talked about how we know that climate change is happening, what causes it, and some of the feedback mechanisms in the physical climate system that make it so difficult to predict. In this show, I'll talk more about what the consequences of climate change will be, why I think it's such a difficult problem to deal with, and what we can do to help. Last episode, we talked about how complicated the climate change issue is. And alongside the complexity and uncertainty making predictions difficult, specific facts about the complexity of the problem make it so easy to spread misinformation. For example, yes, the sun's natural cycles do influence the climate. So do things like cloud cover, Possibly even cosmic rays have some impact on the climate by encouraging cloud formation. Volcanoes have an impact on the climate. And yes, the climate has always changed. These things are indisputable facts. Few people, few climate scientists, would dispute this kind of thing. But even fewer climate scientists would dispute the most important things you need to know about climate change. It is happening. It is us. It will get increasingly serious the longer we continue to do nothing and that cutting emissions is the best way of mitigating it. But this doesn't stop people from constructing denials with varying degrees of intellectual dishonesty behind them. Let me give you a few examples as to how you might easily construct a denialist argument. And if you think I'm being stupid here, bear in mind that I'm taking these from articles or online arguments that I've actually read. So hey guys, it turns out that the oceans naturally release ten times more carbon into the atmosphere than we do. So why the hell are we worrying? Our impact on the planet is tiny, and it's foolish to think we could have a real influence. So, like most lies, this does have a grain of truth in it, if you're not willing to interpret what's going on even a little bit, because the oceans do release roughly ten times the carbon that we do into the atmosphere. They also absorb all of that carbon, and more from the atmosphere, as part of the natural carbon cycle. In fact, by some estimates, of all the CO2 that humans have emitted, over half has been taken up by oceans. And we can see this impact because the oceans are actually becoming more acidic. When carbon dioxide dissolves in water, what you get is carbonic acid, and that is slightly acidic. And that's the sort of thing that's causing ocean acidification, and it's leading to the deaths and bleachings of the coral reef, which we're seeing on unprecedented scales. So there are plenty of links in this natural carbon cycle. For example, plants and trees on Earth absorb huge amounts of carbon, and they release it again when they die. Some of the carbon is locked up in the bodies of these plants, animals and trees that die, and it sinks to the bottom of the ocean, or it's buried underground. And these are the things that eventually become fossil fuels. What we do when we burn coal, oil and natural gas is we disrupt the balance. We're effectively removing that natural sink, the small fraction of plants and animals that end up buried underground, that helps to keep carbon levels stable. But we're burning carbon that comes from plants and animals that died millions of years ago. Worse, when we deforest the landscape, we may be killing plants faster than new ones can grow. Even just a week or two before writing this, I read an alarming report that indicates that, due to deforestation in the tropical rainforests, they are no longer acting as a net sink of carbon. In other words, the death of trees, due mostly to human activity, is emitting more carbon than the new ones that grow can take up. This imbalance, which was only recently discovered, could be equivalent to all of the car and truck use in the US combined. So you shouldn't let anyone fool you about specific aspects of the carbon cycle. The simple fact is that atmospheric CO2 has increased dramatically since we started burning fossil fuels, in ways that it seldom does in all of, record- all of recorded history that we have records for. You know, going back millions and billions of years of data, we, we never see this kind of rate of change. So in pre-industrial times, it was approximately 280 parts per million. Nowadays, it's blasted well past 400 parts per million and consistently reads at those levels. James Hansen of NASA said that a safe level was 350 parts per million. And while that's probably pessimistic, we could probably live with a level higher than that. 
it's true that this current amount is alarming. We have good data on carbon content from ice cores and other sources of record that indicate that the carbon dioxide content in the atmosphere hasn't been this high for millions of years. You don't even have to believe in things like ice core data if you don't want to, because satellites started measuring CO2 levels back in 1955. So you can go find a graph of the Mauna Loa observations online, the Keeling curve it's called, it's very famous, and you will see that it's been increasing every year since they started measuring it. What's more, the average rate of increase since Mauna began measuring was 1.55 parts per million a year, but recently it's been closer to 2.75 parts per million a year, edging towards 3. Why, it's almost as if the carbon in the atmosphere is increasing as our emissions and our human activities that impact the land continue to increase. So if you have an alternative theory that explains why the CO2 in the atmosphere has been increasing due to natural changes in the carbon cycle, nothing to do with the sudden presence of humans pumping CO2 into the atmosphere in a way that's been unprecedented as far as we can tell for millions of years, please publish that theory. You will win a Nobel Prize if it's correct. Of that there is no doubt. But just consider for a second. Sometimes you hear from denialists this idea that climate change is made up by scientists to get a better reputation or more funding or something along these lines. I think that's pretty ridiculous if you actually look at some of the salaries that uh, scientists end up working for. Um, the many years of training that they have to go through, which often involves sacrificing you know, more lucrative careers in industry to pursue their science. And alongside this, if you had conclusive evidence that the scientific consensus was completely wrong about something, if you could prove that almost everyone in the community is going down the wrong lines, well, that's how you become rich and famous, effectively. Einstein is the one who proved Newton's theories wrong, and it secured his reputation for a long, long time. It seems ridiculous to me that you can think that if there was a proper, feasible, scientific way of proving that anthropogenic climate change, the consensus is not true, then people somehow wouldn't have stumbled upon this, that it wouldn't have turned up in the research that was funded by fossil fuel companies who fund all kinds of research into climate change. The reality is that there is no such explanation, there is no such solution aside from that it is what humans are doing. Even ExxonMobil, the uh, huge oil and gas conglomerate, well, they warned about climate change in their internal documents as far back as the 1980s and neglected to tell anyone. So I think it's pretty clear that the scientific consensus around climate change is very, very strong. And the idea that a comment underneath a YouTube video or, or a blog hosted by someone with shady links to the fossil fuel industry is going to be proven to be correct over the vast majority of these scientists is just not true. Now, there is a scope and there is a serious debate to be had about how we should address this problem and how serious the problem is going to be. I would never deny that. And I would never go to the extent of saying that you can just say the words science and then that absolutely means that your beliefs are completely true because scientists disagree with each other. It's not some monolithic thing where every scientist that exists has one view and they all back each other up and they all say, this is exactly how bad it will be, and this is exactly what we should do to fix it. The fact is that almost every reputable scientist agrees that this is a problem, and Barack Obama once put it, if you have 99 doctors who tell you that you're sick, and one who doesn't, who are you going to trust? The real question that's left now is how sick we are, and what the cure is. So here's another way of constructing climate change denial that I've actually seen. It says, yes, the greenhouse effect is real, but water vapour is a much bigger greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Natural water vapour has a much bigger warming effect than CO2. I'll bet scientists haven't considered the effects of water vapour on the climate system. The answer to this one, <laughs> well, there are people who do entire PhDs on this subject. There are people who have dedicated decades of their research lives to this particular subject. The idea that this is some hush-hush conspiracy that no one's looked into, of course they have. And yes, of course we know that water vapour is impacting the climate system. If Earth had no atmosphere at all, no greenhouse gases, no nothing, then we worked out in our simple calculation that the Earth should be around minus 18 degrees Celsius. You say, okay, the Earth has to be in thermal equilibrium, it absorbs as much energy as it emits, that kind of thing. And so, thank God for the greenhouse effect in this sense. Without it, we'd all certainly be dead. 
In fact, in, it's actually far worse than this, because at minus 18 degrees Celsius, if there was no greenhouse effect from the atmosphere, the oceans would freeze, and then we'd have a big snowball Earth, so things would probably be even colder. So, yes, we know that water vapour, methane, carbon dioxide, and other greenhouse gases warm up the planet. And this is why the particularly bonkers brand of denialists who tell you that the greenhouse effect isn't real don't have a leg to stand on. Without the greenhouse effect, we'd all freeze to death. It clearly has a very important impact on climate, but if we continue to enhance it with unmitigated carbon emissions, it could stop being our friend and start being our enemy. And we know, more or less, to what extent the water vapour in the atmosphere influences the climate, because we have these top-of-the-atmosphere radiation readings that tell us how much of the outgoing radiation is absorbed by water vapour. And that's how we know whether water vapour or methane or carbon dioxide is the strongest greenhouse gas. And this is the science that has based, you know, formed the basis for the recommendations that we need to cut carbon emissions. So I think by now, if I haven't convinced you that climate change is happening, I never will. You'll have to listen to someone more persuasive than me, or wait 20 years and see what the global temperature is. The temperature record shows warming. The CO2 record shows that CO2 is increasing. And I've explained how the two are linked. This is more than denialists can do for you. But what will it do to us, and how can we hope to prevent it? This is what I want to come on to. So first, the consequences. The initial consequences we are already seeing. As the atmosphere warms up, it can hold a greater moisture content. Extreme weather events such as hurricanes will become more intense with greater rainfall. Warmer sea surface temperatures where the hurricanes form mean that there's a greater level of energy that's imparted to the hurricane. Hurricanes may not become more frequent, we don't know enough about how they form to say for sure, but they will become more intense. The same is true for droughts and forest fires. And you know, when I first wrote this, this was before the uh, terrible forest fires in California had started occurring. And uh, now we've seen forest fires this year in California, Portugal, unprecedented in scope and scale. The annual cost due to extreme weather events in the US has doubled. Between the years 1980 to 2015, it was 5 billion, but in the last four or five years alone, in the years 2011 to 2015 alone, it was 10 billion. And I think this year, with the banner hurricane season that they've had, it's probably going to be more than those five years combined. Some of this will be due to chance, but not all of it. Flooding events, they become more extreme as sea levels rise due to ice caps melting. Heat-related deaths will increase on hotter days, as hottest day on records, records are continually broken. Ecosystem destruction is worsened by climate change. Vertebrate species with backbones seem to be disappearing at a rate 114 times faster than they do naturally. The oceans will become more acidic due to increased carbon dioxide, which turns water into carbonic acid, and this kills wildlife. The Great Barrier Reef is probably already doomed. Sea level rise due to the melting ice caps, is threatening nations. By 2100, if we do not act, many island nations will be underwater. Bangladesh is already experiencing the fate that may lie in wait for many low-lying nations. There, every year, 20% of the country is flooded. Every four to five years, they have an even bigger flooding event, and 60% of the country is flooded. The flooding events just continue to get worse and more extreme. By 2100, these flooding events will be permanent, 20% of the country will be underwater for good, and a big flood could engulf even more of it. And the result of that, by 2100, will be that 30 million people will be displaced. It will be a slowly unfolding refugee crisis unlike any the world has ever seen. This is equivalent to all the refugees that there currently are in the world, from just one nation. Sea levels will rise between 1 and 4 feet by the end of the century. But sea level rise is a lagging indicator. It unfolds over centuries rather than decades, usually. Melting ice caps and expanding warmer oceans will eventually, if nothing is done, cause the sea level to rise by 2 to 3 metres by 2300. If all of Antarctica melts, which is an outside possibility but could happen with very extreme, unmitigated climate change if feedback loops go completely out of control, then it's simpler to describe, because the sea level rises by 80 metres, and there is no more Florida. These changes will take place over centuries. No one is saying that these places will be underwater, even within our lifetimes, necessarily. But it should concern you. Microbes will thrive in a warmer climate. Diseases like malaria will spread more easily. The sheer heat 
becomes a concern. Currently, we're on course for more than two degrees of warming. The Paris Agreement says that its aim is to limit the world to less than two degrees Celsius from the pre-industrial era by the end of the century. Now, a lot of people have talked about why they chose two degrees Celsius. Part of it is that the feedback loops become more difficult to predict outside of the two Celsius range. A big part of it is that, as far as we know, humans have never survived in a world that's two degrees Celsius warmer than pre-industrial levels. So we're entering uncharted territory as far as human survivability is concerned. Alongside this, it's a round number that makes a good goal. You have to admit that that is part of why two degrees Celsius is a big goal. And you can get deep into the politics of this. Personally, I think that given how likely we are to miss two degrees Celsius, I don't think it should be considered um, as ironclad a goal as it currently is. But I think it's good to have something to aim for. The, the fact is that if it's four degrees Celsius, that's worse than three. And three is worse than two. We want to get it to be as little as possible. So two degrees Celsius is the current target that people have settled on. We'll see how that goes. We're already somewhere between 0.7 and 0.9 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial temperature levels and rising. If our emissions drop to zero by 2060, we'll still be set for 2.4 degrees Celsius of warming. As we're currently going, 3 degrees Celsius looks more, war more likely, and in the worst case where em emissions continue to rise until 2100, this will be closer to 5 degrees Celsius. Here's a quote about some of the consequences. Even if we meet the Paris goals of 2 degrees warming, cities like Karachi and Kolkata will become close to uninhabitable, annually encountering deadly heat waves like those that crippled them in 2015. At 4 degrees, the deadly European heat wave of 2003, which killed as many as 2,000 people a day, will be a normal summer. At 6, according to an assessment focused only on the effects within the US from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, summer labour of any kind would become impossible in the lower Mississippi Valley, and everybody in the country east of the Rockies would be under more heat stress than anyone anywhere in the world today. End quote. Any amount of warming will produce some refugees, but when you get to 4 degrees or 6 degrees, which are worst case scenarios for the end of the century, and practically certain for 2200 if we still can't cut carbon emissions by then, then you're talking about having to evacuate entire regions of the Earth, which will become deserts. Ultimately, I think the real menace from climate change is the factors that we don't know about. We are kicking the Earth into regions that we've never seen, not as observers on this planet. We can infer what things may have been like through studying this paleoclimate data, the climate as it was long ago. But we have no idea what might happen with the reckless and rapid warming that we're currently causing. Damage to the biosphere, to life on Earth, could make things very uncomfortable indeed for humans by destroying the ecosystems we rely on and pushing the Earth's climate out of our control. Compared to the other existential risks on this list, climate change is a bit of an odd one out. It's not as dramatic, at least to begin with. In fact, it's so undramatic that it's not self-evident to anyone that it's happening. And the effects are delayed and uncertain. We could get lucky and continue to burn our merry way through carbon, emitting it all like there's no tomorrow, until we run out of fossil fuels or until it becomes economical to stop. And we could still manage to avoid the worst case scenarios of 4 degrees and 7 degrees that people are concerned about. But climate change differs from AI, from nanotechnology, from meteorite strikes and supervolcano eruptions in one crucial way. This is really happening. If we do nothing, it will get worse. And amongst the many things we don't yet know for sure is just how bad it could get. But we can face this crisis. In fact, the one thing that might make you happy from listening to the series that has for months now focused ruthlessly on the end of the world is that there's always a cause for optimism. I want to take this moment to apologise to all of the people who have told me that I'm being relentlessly doom and gloom and that they're feeling rather depressed, but I think you have to remember that not a single one of the existential risks we've dealt with is in any way inevitable. The biggest threats to our continued existence in the modern age, they're not strange starbursts from outer space, or earthquakes or supervolcanoes from an angry Gaia, or meteorite strikes that 
killed the dinosaurs. The biggest threats are the things that we can control. We have the power to stop this from happening. We can be remembered as the generations who had the foresight to change course, to make a difference, to start living for the first time in a sustainable way. Because you see, there are two stories that people might tell about the human race a thousand years from now. If there are still humans, there will still be stories. This is who we are, this is what we do. We take the chaos and confusion and suffering and madness and beauty around us and we weave it into tales that make sense. So why should the human story itself, when it comes time to tell it, be any different? The first story they might tell goes like this. In the beginning, we were noble savages, and then we began to learn. We learned how to talk, and we learned how to tell each other stories. We were able to create things, abstract concepts, ideas like society, money, technology. Some of these came from our emotions, and we called these love and family. And some came from our intellect, and we called these reason and morality. But there were other darker forces that went hand in hand, Rage, greed, jealousy, paranoia, laziness, the stories from our feelings, and profit, selfishness, greed, avarice, exploitation from the intellect. We learned the principles of science, we made great leaps in understanding nature, we learned how to reshape the world in our own image, and exploit the vast power that came underneath. We learned how to achieve impossible things, things that no other species could ever dream of, we became godlike in our power and ambition compared to them. But in the first story, this power is used carelessly and stupidly. The irony of such great intellect, such great knowledge, the arrogance of even calling our species Homo sapiens, humans the wise, the wise ones, destroying so much of the planet we called home. We destroy ourselves through greed and stupidity, and a lack of wisdom in one way or another. We leave behind a planet far worse and less hospitable. In the second story, there is a turning point. As we realise the fragility of our Earth and the irreversibility of what we're doing to it, gradually we learn and adapt, not just to the circumstances that surround us, but to understand what our actions mean for the future. Rapacious destruction, driven by profit, is replaced by sustainable harvesting for the good of all, including those who will live on this planet after us. This is the story we want people to tell about us. It's the story I want people to tell about us. It's getting to the stage now where, for the first time, renewable energy is starting to become more economical than fossil fuels. Not just when you put a price on carbon, or when you factor in the true economic cost of continuing to burn these unsustainable fossil fuels and the environmental damage they cause. It's just flat out cheaper. As I have mentioned, free market capitalism and Western liberal democracy, although wonderful in many other ways, have not yet been particularly effective at reducing carbon emissions and facing up to climate change. In working against these forces, we've achieved limited success. For example, many countries in Europe have reduced CO2 emissions by 20 to 30% below the levels of 1990, but principally by switching from coal, the dirtiest of all fuels, to natural gas, which produces fractionally fewer emissions, but is still a finite fossil fuel resource. That and energy efficiency. But this was done fairly quickly because it was economical for companies to do so. Savings in energy efficiency are also economical for certain people. It is ridiculous that people continue to drive around in cars that get 17 miles to the gallon, when so many more efficient cars are available. The problem is that people are willing to pay through the nose for petrol and get fleeced by auto companies. Providing people are willing to make these choices, then gas guzzlers will still be bought. But there is hope too here. The price of solar panels that we've talked about in previous episodes is declining rapidly still. Electric cars may be cost competitive with petrol driven cars by 2020, and several governments, including that of China, considered to be one of the worst polluters, have plans to phase out fossil fuel cars and hence electrify the transport system by 2040 to 50. A major motivation behind China is not just the combat of climate change, but also air pollution, which kills many, many people there. The Paris Climate Accords united the world in a complicated, highly ambitious, but feasible goal of keeping warming to below 2 degrees Celsius. 
it might depress you that Trump pulled out of the cl- Paris Climate Change Accords, essentially because it was one of the few achievements he could get that would please his base without congressional approval by executive action. What depressed me more was how little understanding he showed of the issue, oscillating wildly in his speech from climate change isn't happening, we don't know that for certain, to Paris won't make much of a difference, citing an incorrect statistic that it would only save one-tenth of a degree of warming. This actually amounts to a decade of warming at current rates, so even if this was all Paris did, it would just buy us another ten years of time to research the problem and improve mitigation efforts. Ten years, that's not nothing. But in actual fact, Paris does more than this, and alongside that, Paris involves these discretionary contributions that, if we're going to get below 2C, have to be much better than they are at the moment. So the reality is that without a 2 degrees Celsius target, we're probably headed for 3.6, for something like that. So it's a very big difference between a world where we try to mitigate and a world where we don't try at all. But in any rate, Trump is just one man. He will be out of office in three years, or in the very worst case scenario, seven years. The impact he will have on this battle, which will unfold over decades and centuries, will be small. And his actions have galvanised the rest of the world to act on climate, to think about it again. It's so difficult to keep it in your attention when there's a constant news cycle of other things that come up, and this is unfolding so slowly that you can almost pretend that it's not happening sometimes. But China is now leading in the adoption of renewable energy. They have domestic motivations with their smog and air pollution in their cities, but they're still leading. And this would have been unthinkable a few years ago, when we thought that their emissions and their coal would destroy us all. We can decarbonise our economy, and in so doing, we achieve two incredible and worthwhile goals. First, we save ourselves from the risk of catastrophic climate change, which could put an immense strain on civilization and render the lives of many millions miserable. We secure the future of our planet, of life on Earth. The second goal we achieve by doing this is securing the future of our way of life. If we cannot do things sustainably, then sooner or later, resource depletion or ecological degradation is going to kill us as a species. David McKay, who wrote the book on sustainable energy, put it best when he wrote the dedication. The book is dedicated, quote, to those future generations who will have to live without the benefit of a billion years accumulated energy reserves. As humans, we're a little bit like the new student who gets his first student loan through and blows the entire lot on video games, alcohol and fast food in a week. We need to grow up and accept the limitations of what we can do. It is incredible that this world is capable of providing food to feed billions of us, if properly distributed, and resources to create so many incredible things as we have done. But it won't be like this forever if we continue being wasteful and greedy. The world's governments currently spend billions of dollars on expensive militaries, counter-terrorism, foreign wars, that kind of thing. The war in Iraq cost the US government two trillion dollars. If that money had been spent on, well let's face it, almost anything else, it would have been better. If it had been spent on a renewable energy infrastructure, we might not even need to have this conversation. Do you really think that in 40, 50, 60 years' time, if we don't address this problem, things will be any better? A Middle East that suffers from intense heat waves and droughts, and sits on the increasingly rare and precious fossil fuels that the West depends on? Does this seem like it will be a more or less stable geopolitical situation to you? Renewable, sustainable energy is not just an environmental issue, it's a national security issue. Some of the best investment came in response to the oil shocks in the 70s and 80s, It seems as long as the price is kept low, people forget how harmful this dependence is economically and politically, as well as environmentally. There are always going to be some people for whom the future generation's argument doesn't cut it, but perhaps realising how bad the situation could get within our lifetimes, without action, will galvanise people into that action. If our species is going to have any kind of future, we need to make this transition to a more sustainable way of life, and part of that is going to be cutting our carbon emissions down to zero. It's as simple as that. We have the technology, or we can develop it. It's getting better all the time. Humans have achieved incredible things. When we put our minds and resources towards them, the fight against climate change should be no exception. I finally would like to direct you all to a good resource on this, alongside the David McKay book, whose praises I sing all the time. Drawdown is a book and website that goes through the most effective strategies at reducing carbon emissions in a cost-benefit kind of way, ranking them in terms of effectiveness. There are some surprising entries on the list that you might not have thought of, and many of them, particularly the energy efficiency measures, you can make in your own lives to make a difference. 
and many of them, particularly the energy efficiency measures, you can make in your own lives to make a difference. For the others, you can write to your legislators and let them know that this issue is important to you. Find other like-minded people and organise to lobby for these things. If politicians only care about the next election and not the long-term consequences of their actions, we have to make this an issue about the next election. We know what we must do. We know it will be good for us. We know that it won't be easy. It's a bit like staring at a treadmill when you're in the gym. The best thing to do, in both cases, is to just start. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Teotihuacan Specials of Physical Attraction. Hopefully it hasn't been too hopeless for you. If you're interested in climate change, which you should be, there are plenty of good resources out there alongside the McKay book. Uh, I would recommend George Monbiot Heat for an overall introduction to the uh, inequities and so on that stem from climate change. Uh, there's climateprogress.org, which is a good website for keeping up to date on information alongside these things. And just keep your ear to the ground for literature, for news articles from reputable sources, for bills and legislation that impacts this issue, and for things you can do in your own life to be more energy efficient, which, guess what, you know, will save you money as well. So in the long run, it's some, something that everyone wins, and I, you know, I don't see why it's not been implemented more than it has already. So we've got all the way up to number two on our list of the Teotihuacan specials. It's been several months, I've been focused relentlessly on the end of the world, and next episode, you're going to find out what I've picked as the number one. It's a bit less suspenseful than you might think, because I think most of you will probably have figured out what the number one is, based on the existential threat that hasn't quite appeared in the last nine entries. But even so, I hope you'll enjoy it. If you're interested in the show, if you want to help us out, you can donate to us on PayPal. The link is via Twitter. You can find the link on Twitter and donate through PayPal that way. Alongside this, we've got all sorts of other things that you can do. You can go to the website, www.physicspodcast.com. Leave a comment, the activity there. I love to get your comments. It really brightens my day when I get them. It's good to know that people are listening. And alongside that, you know, if there's feedback you have, then you can help me make the show better than it is. And that's what I want to do. That's what you guys want as well. So it's another win-win. Follow us on Twitter at PhysicsPod. We've got a Facebook page, which is just Physical Attraction. Uh, try and scroll through all the relationship advice and you'll find the podcast about physics eventually. Um, you can leave a rating and review on iTunes. But if you don't want to do any of that, just tell one other person about this show. Your podcast buddy who you talk to about podcasts, who's a little bit obsessive with podcasts, who's always wearing the headphones. That person would be a great listener for our show. And you should tell them about it because you enjoy it. I enjoy it. And we both know that if you keep telling people about this show, eventually we're going to have billions of listeners. And when we have billions of listeners, I'll have trillions of dollars and I'll be able to give you a little kickback for getting us to where we are. Until then, stay safe. You better make some preparations. There's no time for hesitations. Compile a list of tips. Our theme music is Get Ready for the Apocalypse by Astrometrics. Do get ready